Welcome, everyone, to the first annual ever Lab Tech Geek live stream. Nothing will ever show you how to use LTCS info. Yes, first annual. Today we'll be covering the ConnectWise REST API utilizing Python. Uh, for those of you who do not know, uh, the ConnectWise APIs is, are actually really quite nice uh, in terms of how to get, move, change data within ConnectWise itself. Um, I don't know about First Weekly. Uh, that, that'd be a lot on a lot of people. <laughs> um, but specific, uh, specific with the APIs, um, LabTech doesn't have an API as far as I'm concerned, even though some people mention one. Um, Python itself, I chose to utilize Python because it's really simple to understand. Uh, and it, it's, it, it's really easy to grasp. Um, so uh, as you can tell, I have uh, an IDE open. Um, this is called PyCharm, and it's free. Um, the community edition is free. Uh, so basically, all I've done so far to get this set up is install Python 3, the latest version, and PyCharm. And PyCharm uh, loads everything you need to get started. And one of the reasons I picked PyCharm is because I can actually run the code inside of PyCharm um, and, and get any output I need uh, and help you know debug and, and test things. So when I move it to a permanent host or permanent server, it can just run indefinitely unless it breaks. So first off, before we jump into the Python code itself, um, since this is the first ever stream we've ever done as a community um we want to do more of these um stuff like this i think is uh and, and all the admin team thinks is super helpful and super uh important because text doesn't always convey meanings and having an, an uh, a video to go along with uh will you know go along with how you set stuff up and how to change things uh is is high on our radar to do um but we want stuff from you guys on what to cover um as well as volunteers to cover that stuff um i know gavin uh has volunteered to do a stream at some point in time on uh how to how to, how to make a report uh And uh, he's probably going to, yeah, he, yeah, he, we haven't specified, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, I know you did, Gav. Um, so we, we want to do more of these, um, and uh, with stuff like this, I mean, we have 50 people watching my screen right now, which is just amazing in general, um, if you ignore all the tie bar items. Um, let, me, let me get rid of Steam, because I don't think we're going to play games for now uh but uh mindy did agree to do one as well um he didn't specify what topic uh but we we want to do more of these and i think the community itself want to uh wants more of these and uh i know for a fact lab tech themselves uh would appreciate having to point even more support our way um i would play dota 2 except uh i i would be horrible at it and it would just be embarrassing. Uh, but so if anyone would want to volunteer to run a stream, uh, I can assist you in getting you set up and running. Um, it, it's a very simple process and it's a very simple uh, system to set up and run. Uh, and it, it, it is quite simple. So if anyone wants to volunteer or has any ideas on... Uh, 
what they want to do or, you know, what content you want us to cover. And uh, that just, you know, shoot me a, a message, shoot anyone on the admin team. It's in the uh, the, the listing below the, the view video right there on who you can message or talk to. Um, this stream is being recorded uh, and it will be put up on our YouTube channel later. I'll throw something in uh, the... I don't know if anyone is a patching guru um, outside of LabTech themselves being a patching guru. Uh, so shoot me a message, shoot any one of the admins a message, um, post on the forums. We'll, we'll, we'll look for just about anything um, we can get. Uh, while I agree that LabTech is not patching gurus, as far as the knowledge base of what is available, they are probably the, uh, the, the most uh, knowledgeable about patching because they wrote it. Doesn't say it works now, it's very important, but, uh, but they, they, they did write it. So, um, one more thing before we get started. Uh, we are still taking donations. Um, we are almost ready to deploy the new forums. Um, we're super excited about that. You'll have announcements and stuff coming out about that hopefully soon. Um, but we're still taking donations uh, to, to, to maybe host some more live streams and stuff like this to, uh, you know, to, to make the community better, not just with lab tech, but with all the with the scam suite. Um, and, and, and attract more, you know, broad audience as most people who have one of the applications also have another in the suite itself. Um, and, and we want to broaden the community itself, which is one reason why I'm focusing on ConnectWise in our first one. Um, there's a lot of content uh, in, in our forums uh, and in the community itself about lab tech or automate. Um, and uh, I figured we could get some more with uh, ConnectWise. And while... I've had my hand in ConnectWise. Uh, we will not be renaming uh, us to Automate Geek. Um, that is that is not going to happen. Uh, I'll be covering mainly ConnectWise Manage APIs today. We may, if we have time, interact with the database for LabTech. Um, just depending on how how things go, uh, but we're mainly going to focus on the Manage itself. The problem with calling it ConnectWise Geek uh, is, is is the fact that uh, I came up with ConnectWise as the PSA system. So when I refer to ConnectWise, uh, then I think the app ConnectWise Manage. Um, so calling it ConnectWise Geek would make me just think it's, again, just a ConnectWise Manage area. So to get started... Um, we're going to need some additional Python libraries to actually make this run. So before I show you how to get those, um, we're going to do some basics of programming for those of you um, who, who haven't either touched programming or looked at Python at all. Um, <clears throat> so while... Uh, so... so the basics of, of programming, the logic of how uh, work goes, is the same across all languages. The words and the structure of which you use those is different. Um, that is actually 100% correct, uh, metagostic, uh, and, and how you do it. Um, the first thing are variables to store information. You got to store data to present data to manipulate data. You have to have somewhere to store it. So usually they call those variables. So in Python, that is a variable. Um, Python doesn't care uh, what a variables are, what, what a variable is. It will define a variable by what you make it. Um, with other languages, you have to specify if it's a uh, if it's an integer or if it's a string or if it's a float or binary or if it's Boolean or anything like that, um, Python doesn't care. It'll process it on its end um, and, and determine that. Um, so you can have as many variables as you want with as much data as you want.
if I can spell correctly. Um, these are all valid variables, and if I run this, it'll just say executed perfectly, no issues. Um, but the important thing is to show data. How do you give visualization that what you did worked? Um, and you can do that a number of ways. You can, let's say you're moving a ticket from one board to another. You can do that. You can open up ConnectWise, look at the ticket and see where its location is. Check the audit trail, make sure it was moved. Um, and, but to, to, to show you locally without having to do all that, you can just print variables. Hello world, first ever First ever uh, things you do when you when when you do any type of programming is to output hello world. So, as you can tell, it output hello world. But you can also print out your variables. Yes, I did take it from the chat window. Um, but as you can see, uh, we're storing data inside those variables. And that is the key point in uh, working through code. Um, another important thing is function. A function is a subset of code that is only called when you want it to do something. Um, you define a function in Python using DEF and the function name, followed by a colon. So functions allow you to uh, to input information and then output information. So if you want to check to see if that ticket was moved, you can do that in a function. If you want to move the ticket, um, you can you can do that. There is no semicolons at the end of uh, any of this, uh, which is very confusing coming from a PHP programmer. Um, it's very difficult to understand that, um, which is which is really fun. Um, so uh, this is the basics of Python. Define a function and do things with the data. Um, uh, do not criticize PHP. Um, so, someone wanted me to, to, to print this, uh, so I'm gonna do it. Um, you can thank Gab for that. Direct all your hate towards him. Uh, so moving on to the importance of accessing ConnectWise and their API. Um, there is a developer portal for ConnectWise called developer.connectwise.com. If you don't have an account there, I recommend you log in. Um, and uh, register an account so that you can actually look at their documentation on how they want things structured. Because getting data and updating and changing data are so, so different that it's not even funny. Um, and it can take hours of poking through what it expects to. Thank you, K Group. Um, hours to just filter through and, and poke at it to make sure that uh, the reference is in the uh, developer.connectwise.com. Um, so this is the reference. Uh, to documentation, ConnectWise manage. Boom, you're there. And it's always REST API, don't use uh, SOAP. So the, the first thing you need is an API key. Um, I'll post it on the forum as well, though, uh, and, and probably throw something in the, in the channel and maybe the announcements as well. Um, 
so uh, just just to make sure that it gets recorded, that uh, I am recording, at least it's telling me it's recording. If not, I'm sorry. Uh, but it's it, it, I'll 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 make an announcement about it specifically. All right. So let me. pull up some information. Everything you need requires a an authorization code. Um, and ConnectWise has a specific way they want you to auth authenticate. Um, and the way you authenticate is your company ID plus uh, your public API key colon private key. And that is then encoded in base 64. So while I have a key already, there's a website called uh, base64encode.org. Uh, um, that'll allow you to put this basic information in, filled in with your API keys and your company ID, and encode it for yourself. Um, it'll be a long string of letters and numbers and stuff, um, something like this. Um, and that, while well, won't work, but uh, something like that will show you uh, what your API key is. Um, and you'll need that every time you get data from ConnectWise. Uh, Medic, I said REST API. Um, so I already have this uh, in my hidden stuff code. So to uh, in, a, in a main file like this where I'm going to centrally run everything, um, I'm going to have a, a secondary file that stores my static variables. Uh, these are variables that don't change, like uh, my website, um, uh, specific ticketing sites, or my authorization key, or how I structure my authorization header. Um, you can create uh, a static variable page, which I did, um, like this, and this will uh, show you, um, this you can link to other pages via the import function. So if I come over here and do import, oops, import static variables, I can now call functions out of this. So to call a function, print, or to call a variable out of this, you do the page dot variable name. So if I run this, I'll get static variables. Good catch, group. So. Static variables uh, will make it easier in the long run when you're doing stuff that has to constantly be done. Um, so I'm going to open this file. And then I'm going to open all right so let me explain what this does so I've set a variable called header off um, that is exactly required what connectwise wants when you try to authenticate 
to its information. So the REST API utilizes, uh, could utilize a number of types of information. You can use encoding information. You can either use JSON, um, which is JavaScript notation. You can use XML if it's required or allowed, um, and a couple others. We're going to use JSON because it's just uh, structurally easier to, to filter out. Um, it's less, uh, it's more structured data and, and less fluff, um, so like something like XML would, would output. Um, so basically, uh, this is exactly, the header off variable is exactly what ConnectWise wants. I like my notifications, thank you very much. Um, so authorization hidden stuff dot off is my off key, which uh, we went over a second ago. And the content type is application JSON. So we're saying, hey, ConnectWise, here's my authorization to connect to you, and here's how I plan on receiving and transmitting data. The base URL is my ConnectWise URL. Um, it's my website.com with this attached to the end of it. So it's, it's, it's very simple um, and it stays the same throughout anything you query to the ConnectWise REST API. So if I can, with this information, we can now actually call ConnectWise and say, hey, ConnectWise, can I have some information? So to do that, we need a library called requests. And that doesn't come default with Connect or with Python or with PyCharm. So we have to get it. Um, and to do that, you use what they call PIP, P-I-P. Uh, that is correct, Rube. Um, we are not. Uh, I am not ConnectWise hosted. Your host URL is different. I think it's um, it's whatever you log into ConnectWise with. Um, na.connectwise.com or .net. Something like that. Um, so hosted CW is a little bit different than on-premises. I'm on-premises because I like to be able to have good software and utilize it. But to access pip, we use the Python variable. So it's something like api-na.myconnectwise.net. Yeah. So that shows that I don't, uh, I don't have na.myconnectwise.net. Something like that. Either way, uh, it, it, it should be available on the, in the documentation that shows you where, how to connect. Um, so if you sign up to developer.connectwise.com, then you'll be able to find out your API itself. So it, it's API-NA or, uh, I guess if you do EU or AU or anything like that, I guess it alters to that. Yeah. NA, the, re the, the uh, API-region.myconnectwise.net. It's just not going well right now. There we go. All right. This the default uh, 
if you don't change the default installation for Python, I put mine in C Python usually, but I guess uh, in a rush to make sure I had everything ready, I did not change that. Um, so uh, C users app data local program Python, Python 6432, um, 3632, excuse me, is where you can access uh, Python it itself. Um, I'm going to go to the scripts folder and make sure that pip is there. Yep. So Python pip install requests. Come on now. This is just, this is it's what happens when you're not prepared. Be prepared, everyone. Finally. Ugh. Now requests is installed. Thank you, Norm. It's it's just it's 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 rough. So uh, I'll just edit that out. I'll just edit that out. No 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 one will ever see that. Um so to make sure we have that file, we import requests. Now we have uh, that library imported. So now we can set a data variable request. So we're calling that library get URL equals base URL, which is actually in hidden stuff. So while that, that variable itself doesn't contain all the data we need, we need to add to it. And you can do that with the plus, uh, the plus symbol. And now we can put a string in, service, tickets. And to pull a specific ticket ID, you just put in the ticket number behind this. Now, I don't want to personally uh, query my entire database for all my tickets. It limits to like 250 records default or 50 records default or somewhere around there. 20, actually, it might be 25. Um, I have a ticket I'm going to query so that we can play with. Let me pull that number. And then we need to authenticate. Headers equal... Header equals, oops, hidden stuff dot. Oh, this is actually static variables. Header off. So if I run this, I didn't import it on static variables. Hmm. Let's see if that is actually not defined. It is defined. Let's see. 
And here comes the part where I uh, be quiet while I troubleshoot stuff because yeah, it's there. Oh, hold on one second. It's because I'm in the wrong section editing stuff. Whew. This is going real well now, guys. Real well. So let me put this back in here. So, this response 200. Uh, thank, thank you, Simple Fusion BR. Um, as you can see, we got a response 200, which means everything is A-OK. -okay. But there's data in there. And the way that Python structures it, the requests uh, library adds in the dot content. So, if we do this we should spit out the actual data. As you can see, it's kind of uh, hideous looking um, and, do and, and doesn't really portray much. Plus you got that B and that apostrophe at the beginning. That's because it hasn't been formatted back to JSON data, which is easily implemented and messed with and touched. So at that point, we override our standard variable with the same variable plus JSON. Oh, then we can remove the content. Now, it still looks uh, slightly odd um, because that's how JSON looks. Um, it's a key ID uh, format, which is called a dictionary in Python. So it's key ID. So if you were thinking SQL, think column and data. So computer ID one. Something like that. This way, uh, and all of the REST API functions uh, require JSON or XML. I prefer JSON, um, again, because it's just, it seems easier to, to process. Um, and each comma separated value is just like a CSV file. It determines a separate column and a separate, a separate key and a separate value. So if I were to come up here and do summary key, it would output, uh, hit the wrong button. But this is the output. I'm having internet issues with my Outlook Finance application. We have now processed the summary of a ticket inside of ConnectWise with very little actually done. Isn't that awesome? Now you ask, well, that's great, but what do I, what do, I do with it? You can do whatever you want. You now have access since you have access to the ConnectWise API, you can update this ticket, you can change the summary, you can change uh, uh, the board ID, you can, you can update and change just about anything you want. Um, but we're going we're gonna to recreate something. Um, and I think it'll be easier to, to recreate this, uh, uh, something I've already written, um, that's beneficial, in my opinion, to everyone. So ConnectWise managed 2017.4. Um, if you have that version, you can institute a 
uh, a connection between lab tech and screen connect so that you can on the ticket itself kick, click the configuration and launch either the computer screen old or new or straight into a connect a screen connect session um, and that's amazing that's cool single pane of glass we can log in boom right there it's a, it, it, it's great problem is every contact is different and they all have different PCs so connecting in or, or finding the configuration for every single contact that opens a ticket is painstaking. Not only does your technicians have to go from, hey, this is, uh, you know, this is John Smith. Let me open up the configurations in the ticket. Let me scroll through all the thousands of configurations I probably have in there. Let me find his and let me add it to this ticket. That's 30, 45 seconds that is going to take time and that's going to add up so much over 10, 15 technicians over eight hours um, throughout the day. So it's, it, it's problematic, but it's a great feature. How do you solve that feature? Well, you can't do it with ConnectWise. It's, it's not an option. You can't attach a PC to a primary contact. So every time they open a ticket, that's automatically assigned. That doesn't exist, unfortunately. So personally, I went outside of ConnectWise. So we're going to recreate that tonight. And we may have a stop in between. So if you have to go, like I said, this video is being recorded. Please feel free. Um, I will spam the YouTube video with ads so that we make money. Um, thousands of ads, 90%, 90% worth of ads. Um, but now that we've got information, let's start making this information useful and doing stuff with it. So for that, we're going to need a few, really only just one. Let me. Pull what I need. Yeah, that's what I thought. So we're going to install py mysql. If I can type that in. I cannot type that in. This will allow us to interact with mysql databases um, and, and update, query them, select data, and stuff like that. Um, very important. And that's all we're going to need from there for now. So let, let's personally, I like to structure what I'm doing um, and to have something that's looping like you would want to do for adding a PC to a ticket. So you have a couple of options in doing this. You can search your entire ticket board. You can search your entire ticket database or you can search uh, for individual statuses. Um, personally, I look for specific boards. Um, and with the REST API, uh, you can do that by what they call conditions. And you can look at all the conditions available in the developer.connectwise.com section. Um, but conditions are things that you look for. So at the end of your basic URL, which is right here, Service tickets, conditions equal ID one, two, three, four, five. The ID in, in this case is the ConnectWise ticket ID. So your service record. Um, if you're in the database, it's SR service rec ID. Um, if you want to look at status, you can do status, name, new percent 20 ticket. ConnectWise, since you're using this over the web, you have to manually hard code or encode spaces and stuff like that. So percent twenty is uh, the browser's way of determining that this is a space in between new and ticket. So on the back end, that's just flipped to a space. So you can search through all your tickets, limit twenty-five, which is the default um, of the status of new ticket. 
I take this a step further. And board name equals my board. So I'm specifically targeting my board with ticket statuses that are in new ticket. How many tickets on my board are new? It should be a small amount. So after I find this data, I want to process this data. I want to get the primary contact of that ticket, and I want to take that, change, the, manipulate the data that's there to find that what their username could be. So that could be first initial, last name, um, first name, last initial, first name dot last name, yada, yada, yada. So I want to iterate over the data of their name and output it in several different conditions. And then I want to take that and go to lab tech and say, lab tech, find me a computer that this user is currently logged into. And with that, if it finds a machine, I want to get as much data on that as I think is useful to my technicians, go back to ConnectWise and say, is there a configuration with this ID? If so, add it to the ticket. If not, update that ticket, say I didn't find anything. This way we have uh, uh, a method of finding the information, we have a method of letting know, hey, we processed this ticket, we didn't find anything or we did find something, and we accomplish our tasks quite simply. Now, since I've, I'm technically cheating and I've already written this application, mine runs every 20 seconds on three different boards. Uh, good luck with that group. Hey, put him on the call. Just hang out. He can, he can learn how to use the ConnectWise API as well. Um, so uh, I have it running every 20 seconds, and every 20 seconds it's checking three boards, new tickets on those boards, processing the new tickets on those boards, updating them if they need to be updated, and then skipping them if they need to be skipped, and then continuing on to the next section. Um, I also have something else that's running in there, which we can cover later, but I have something else running that also processes during that 20. This all happens every 20 seconds. So if it's 20 seconds, it, when it completes, it sleeps for 20 seconds, and then it continues on. Any questions on anything I have so far from the chat? From the 41 amazing individuals who are watching me? 40 now. Oh, someone left. I guess I insulted someone by causing them amazing. Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Uh, I will not be posting it. I will be rewriting it in front of you. Uh, that's a good question, Medic. Um, at that point, that would be up to the technician to change. Um, the, the, the issue you're going to face is not every ticket is going to be related to their workstation. It may be a server issue, and it may be uh, an OS issue or a, uh, an, an application issue on the web, like Office 365 or something like that. Um, so it's going to be, at that point, the technician's discretion to remove that configuration. And thank you. Uh, Medic asks, what if the user's ticket is unrelated to their workstation? Um, so basically, if, if that is the case, then you want, uh, then it's going to be the technician to have to, to, to know that. No one's ever going to know what their issue is unless they are super on point with what the actual problem is. Um, and if they are, good on you. Don't ever lose that client. Um, but this way, you put you give them initial data sets and they have the option of changing it if they need to. Um, that way, it, it, having most of the tickets covered and having to change one or two if it's a server issue or Office 365 issues, not a big deal. But this will also in ConnectWise, if you don't know, um, 
you can track data on configurations and contacts. So you can actually run uh, reports based on what configurations are uh, you know the problematic is is it the conf- is it the computer or is it the user? You know you can start targeting specific data sets so you can make decisions important company decisions based on that information. And if we aren't in a business of efficiency and automation, then you're probably in the wrong business because that's literally all most of us do all day and we love it and it's great. And that's why I went outside of ConnectWise to do what I could not do inside of ConnectWise. Um, so to, to start writing this, um, personally, I like to uh, set up my information structured. So I don't want to write 30 lines of code when only it processes 10% of the time. Um, so when I write code, I like to structure it in functions. Um, and you know, one function may call another function inside of itself. So let's, let's define our main function. Um, that doesn't happen there. So we're going to define our main loop. And we want to loop through our tickets every X amount of time. Um, and this way we can determine if it works. I structure my data if it's a function name. Uh, everything is capitalized. If it's a variable, the first initial is lowercase, and everything after that is capitalized, every word. So if it's a function function uh, help me work if it's a variable it'd be help me work this is just so I personally can visualize this is a function call and this is a variable call now uh, the way Python works it writes through uh, starts from the beginning to the end. So if you write a function and you call another function that's below it, it's not going to process that until it gets to that function. So it's going to error out. So we need to write all of our good functions up here. So let's write a process new tickets function. And we don't need anything inside to call it, so let's return true. This function is going to process all of our boards individually. We're going to separate this code from running multiple times. Um, this way, it's a little bit easier to understand where a breakdown is in a code base. That's not the right function. All right, let's see if I can't find you. All right, so. Since we're going to be checking multiple boards, we're going to have one function that calls every other function with data we want. So let's define a check for new tickets. Let's rename this one to process boards, make it a little bit more clear. Check new tickets. Ticket ID. If we want to specify a ticket ID, we want to check. Maybe we'll use that in the future. We probably won't in this case. Um, board ID. And URL if we want. So I've specified uh, these just so that it stops flagging me. Um, I've specified information inside this that uh, inside the function itself that you have to specify if this didn't have the equals 
uh, quotation, quotation. That means you're required to give me this information before I run. So if I had and return true. If I did this, it would error out because I didn't give it the data it's asking to give. While the data above it, I'm setting that inside the function. So while I may provide this information, if not, ignore it. So now we're going to write our conditions. This is for when I, uh, for when we call the URL uh, to get the data. So if we're looking at board, if the help desk board, we want to find out what that ID is. Now, if you have access to your database, you can do a select star SR board, um, or you can use an application called Postman. Postman is uh, an output. It basically takes stuff like this right here and simplifies it. Um, while you could query a ticket that's on the help desk board and look for the board ID that it has, you can also search by board name, by anything else that's conditional inside the ticket. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll pull up Postman later to show you guys how that works. Um, it's a pretty fantastic application for troubleshooting and getting out data. Um, so our conditions are going to be service. We look in the service section, and we're going to look for tickets. And specifically, we're going to look for conditions that meet Oops. new ticket. And need a space. Uh, so now this is going to look for tickets that are in new status and inside the operations health dashboard. That way, let me that way I can. Why would you want to encode it, Kegro? I mean, it's entirely possible there's a URL encode your query string. Um, I mean, I guess you could, uh, you know, it could be concerned considering. Uh, it's all HTTPS. It won't let you. Uh, it won't let you HTTP over the API. Um, oh, so request does do this. Thanks, AWOX bear. AWOX bear. Interesting. Oh, gotcha. URL encode. I was thinking actually encoding it. Um, yes. Sorry. It's. It's just what I got into the habit of doing because you they do it with Postman. So I did it when I was, uh, I just basically copied and pasted from over to there. Um, thanks for the help, guys, um, with that. Uh, yes, you can use uh, parameters. It will uh, auto URL encode. I haven't heard that term in a long time. But back to this. Um, so we're going to gather our information. So now we need to do a ticket data uh, requests dot get URL equals base oops, hidden stuff dot base URL plus conditions headers equal hidden dot oops, nope it's on static first static dot header off. We now have a variable 
See, I don't even know Postman. It is bad PHP habits. It is definitely bad PHP habits. Um, Postman, I did not know Postman had a button that did that. See, this is this is why we're a community because I don't know half this stuff. But I make, but it works. That's all that matters. As a developer, it doesn't matter how it looks, what it looks like, or how you get to the end result. As long as you don't purposely expose something that doesn't need to be exposed. And it works. You're golden. All right. So now that we have our ticket data, we're going to run a for loop. So uh, a for loop is going to iterate over every ticket we have. So if we get one ticket, it's going to go over. Uh, you hush, Mindy. Uh, it's going to go over uh, every individual. It's going to go over that one. Um, if you have multiple tickets, it's going to go over each one individually and process what you want to process. So in this case, for ticket and ticket data, we are going to process the name now I already know the structure of this so I'm gonna cheat a little bit in the JSON code it looks like this let me just do this Looks something like that. Um, that's the JSON structure that comes through. So when you're assigning that to a variable, um, and actually I missed the section because forgot to convert it back to JSON. So the code come out comes out. Uh, similar to this, and you can assign uh, keys. So you can look at the specific keys. So with the contact key, I want to look for the name key inside that uh, sub-dictionary um, and get that information. Now, if I output this, let's print ticket. Oops. Contact name Just to make sure this, just to make this much easier. What was my ticket ID? So, well, I don't want to build the loop yet. I'll just call this chat new tickets. I don't need to check any IDs and step 10. Hmm. Welcome to ConnectWise and the REST API. That means it didn't like how that came across. So if I do this, it should print out. Come on. No, you don't need to do anything with that. You're right. Contact uh, is not set. Um, it's it's the the object is listing as none 
um, inside this. And it does that because that contact that I've added is not created inside ConnectWise. Um, the ticket set, that's where the condition's looking at. Um, it, it doesn't matter the ticket set. It's the, the issue is that it's pulling uh, something that doesn't necessarily exist. So I ran into this issue when writing this code, and I forgot that I did this again. But if contact is empty, then you have to look at contact name so uh if it's not an actual contact inside your connectwise database then it's not going to have a contact diction dictionary um so it dumps that into a contact name field along with other contact information outside of the dict um so now that we've discovered this bug, let's fix it. So I have two options. We can write a function to process this, which is probably the better option, or we can just do an if statement. Correct, uh, Mark West. Um, it's a, it's a none type object, meaning it's not set. There's there's no data there, um, so it can't really act, uh, it can't really output or set a variable to that because it doesn't necessarily uh, exist as an actual object. Um, Forks, we're writing something that allows you to interact with ConnectWise and LabTech basically automatically add configurations to a ticket based on the primary contact. So um, we're checking to see if contact name is blank, which it will be if uh, there's a contact already set, i.e. it's a contact that's in your database as a registered contact to a company. Um, John Smith is a name that I just typed in on this ticket, and it's going to error out if it's not right. Actually, that's wrong. This is this is this is wrong. We can check that. So Python try and accept. Basically, we want to attempt something. And if that doesn't work, it errors out. We want to do this instead. It's more like an, a, a more intelligent if statement. Um, standard if statement is if something true, false, greater than, less than, equals process code. Um, this basically says try to process this block of information. If it fails, process this other block of information. And you can use this to, to build out an error system or to uh, do what I'm about to do, which is probably bad, but it works. Um, and it doesn't slow down the information. Um, is we're going to try to set uh, the variable for contact name. Let's pause the equal sign over here. That's what's broken. And we're going to get their full name. So that outputs their full name. We know that for sure. Um, now, we want part of their name. We don't want the entire thing. Because running, you know, sometimes there may not be a full uh, login. You may not log in with John Smith. John Space Smith to, to log into Active Directory. Um, it may be John Smith, it may be J Smith, it may be John S. Or something completely different, which we haven't even planned for, but that's a problem for future me, not current me, as I like to say. Um, so we're going to split their name.
Come on. Oh, no, let's just do this. Full name dot split. Now, this, uh, the split function uh, will allow you to split information based on what you specify as the split. So uh, in this case, the default is a space. So it's going to split in a space. So I'll have name split one and name split two. Um, this is another section of dictionaries and lists inside programming is um, they call them uh, indices. So name split equals John in this case. Let me just do this. And name split one equals Smith. So basically you're saying you're an array of data. You're a dictionary of data. And it, it's more of a, a list in this case. Um, there's two types of arrays, three types of arrays in Python, tuples, dictionaries, and lists. I'm not going to cover tuples because it's not needed right now. So uh, a list is identifying information uh, in, a, in a loop. So the indice of name split zero is going to return John. So instead of like a key value, like a summary is, I'm having internet issues with an Outlook Finance application, you're doing a number instead of a word or an, another identifier. It's just a number. So since that didn't work, we're going to do full name equals ticket contact name. And then we're going to split that. So we're going to try to split their full name if they're a contact recorded in the database. And if not, we're going to split their temporary contact name so we can have that. So we want to start identifying our variables. Name split. This is going to look kind of confusing. This basically says I want, uh, I'll just output it just to make it a little so you can see it. Oops. So I want the first name of name split, and then I want the first letter of that name. So now I have my initials, J and S, John Smith. So I've took the indices and specified I only want the first letter of that indice. So this can means we can easily create a first name, first initial, last name, uh, first name, last initial in finding this information. First initial, last name equals F name, oops, plus name split one. First name, last initial equals name split zero plus 
last name. Now we have Jay Smith. Isn't that easy? It's really not. All this typing just to get Jay Smith out of this ticket. But it's not about where you're at, it's the destination, right? So, now that we have that, we can easily start looking at getting data to LabTech and saying, hey, LabTech, do you have any information on this? So, Personally, we are structured in a group. We have our team. We have teams where clients are in their individual team, and they're structured that way. So, client A puts in a ticket with team A, and never any other team. Um, and they're grouped that way for permission sets and lab tech. So, if they're accessing lab tech, they're pulling group permissions, and they only see what's in that group. So, I personally limited my search to that group inside of lab tech. You don't have to do that. But I uh, in limiting more data is, is always better if you have the opportunity. Um, and on that note, I'm going to take a break. Um, and I will be back momentarily. <clears throat> All right, enough with that. That was fun. Little side uh, side goofing off there. All right. Let me get back to where I was at. All right, so oh my God, where the gav? It costs money. I made it cost gav coins to 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 make a song request. So you just went down in gav coins. So, uh, someone asked me in Slack uh, if I could go over the API key generation um, a little bit more. And I said yes. So, I'm going to right-click on my folder for my new project. I'm going to create a new Python file. I'm going to call this Other Hidden. So to, to, to cover the basics, um, you will have, uh, if you go into your member, there will be a tab called API um, that allows you to, let me do something real quick. Boom, there. All right, Tyler, you're now a mod. Um, have fun with that. Don't kill anybody. Uh, so you'll be able to um, 
you'll go to the API tab and you'll be able to generate an API key. You'll get the public and private API key at that point in time. Record those because the private key will never be shown again. It is highly important that you record those somewhere if you ever want to actually utilize this API key without generating another one. Um, so in here, in this instance, you can put in your company. Let's go Latte Geek. That's my acronym. My public key will be some weird jumblination of other stuff. Private key will be the same. And then you'll encode this. Um, so if I run this, I don't have base 64 installed. Let me see if it's, if it's default or not. It is. Awesome. Oh, let's see, this is, I should just stop on my head. So this is what prints out, this long string, which is wrong, because it's missing a double equal sign at the end of it. If it's a valid key, it'll have a double equal sign at the end of it, generally from what I've seen. Um, and it could just be the fact that uh, the way Python generates it, which as you can see, this is an issue for me that I haven't resolved yet. Um, because it outprints as a byte file with the actual data. Um, and you can see that here. So when you create your member uh, public and private key, uh, the way ConnectWise structures it is just like this. Um, so if you go to base64encode.org, excuse me, um, you type in company plus sign your public key colon your private key and you hit encode you'll get your authorization string and the way ConnectWise uh, expects you to have that is is in this format here uh, it's it's just a, a JSON snippet um, that allow that says uh, a key value of authorization um, I'm pretty sure it's uh, let me verify over here. Uh, yeah, the authorization is something like this. Um, basic, uh, based 64 encoded string here. Um, and this, that, and that's exactly what it's expecting where this variable is right here. Um, this hidden stuff underscore or dot off. Um, that's basically outputting this in this section here when it's sending the, the data over. Um, uh, see you later, Mindy. Um, have, have fun with that. With whatever you're, you're leaving my awesome, awesome stream to do. So back to the, the, the initial code. Now that we have our username, let's, let's look for them. Let's find them. I did not know that, Mr. Mark West, that the private key is a hash of your password and the public key is a hash of your username. Hmm. Learn something new every day. I'm, that doesn't make me comfortable at all, actually. I wish it was just randomly generated, but hey, it is what it is, right? So, now that automate SQL, let's write some SQL code to pull data from LabTech. I have my Oops. 
Wait. Got to get my stuff right. So, if you can see this, uh, let me see. I don't know if I can turn word wrap on. There we go. So we're looking for a computer. We're going to try to pull the computer name and the computer ID from the computer's table where our username is similar to first initial last name. And this is the one of the most, this is a, a tricky part as well when I was initially building this application, um, which I haven't showed you guys the name yet. It's called Scam Assist. Um, so those of you who uh, understand that, if you output the ConnectWise uh, suite in a specific section, ConnectWise Sell, ConnectWise Connect, ConnectWise Automate, and ConnectWise Manage, the acronym as SCAM, they hate it. Um, management does, at least. And it is the best. Um, from what I understand, they also renamed their Cloud Console platform to Unite, so it is now literally SCAM U which could not be just it's the best ever. It's just amazing. Um, there could be nothing better uh, that they could have done than name their products uh, in an acronym of SCAMU. So it's called Scam Assist. Um, and... Its function is to assist in the uh, ConnectWise scam suite, uh, and it uh, to just just to do things that it can't normally do on its own or can't do inside of its own application. Um, and that's the that was the main purpose of building out this nice little Python app. So. And then we want to make sure and. So, uh, we're also checking to make sure that the client is mapped in, uh, oh my God, that's great. Slut. That is just great. Uh, in Seattle, we have South Lake Union Trolley, which acronyms to slut, which is, that is, that is great. Um, but we're, uh, with the, the little bit of SQL snippet I just wrote, uh, we're checking also if the client is present in the client mappings, i.e. is this client mapped? Um, because if it's not mapped, why are we looking for this? in the first place because it's definitely not going to be, it should definitely not be in ConnectWise if the client isn't in ConnectWise or is it pulled from ConnectWise or at least matched up with ConnectWise. So now that we have our SQL, oops. Now that we have our SQL, we want to process it. Uh, So this goes back to stuff we also want to do. Um, since we added this earlier, we want to include uh, Py, Python MySQL. Um, and from that, we want to import specifically cursors. Um, you can also do uh, import 
import pi mysql dot cursors to just import that specific section, but we've already done it from this above here. So we're just going to come back down to here. And let's All right. And now we're going to have some issues uh, that we're going to. So uh, there's going to be some instances where we have multiple computers, let's say John Smith is the uh, lead um, lead IT guy. Um, hold on one second, I'll be right back. And we're back. So, uh, back to where I was. Uh, let's say John Smith is a uh, primary contact, and he's the, the, the smart hands. He's the guy who's in the servers. He's doing stuff as well, basic things. Um, he's their guy that uh, takes most of the, the stupid stuff off of you, like password resets and, and things along that nature. Um, so, well, you can limit servers, but what if the server issue is a server? And that's, you, you can... Uh, make sure uh, what if he's logged into multiple computers and you may not know which one's the right one so it's best to give all the information to the technician and let them figure out which ones to remove because it's much easier to remove configurations in connect wise ticketing than it is to add them so now that we have this SQL that's processed we're going to have to loop through it so for comp in process sql do stuff so how does lab tech know that this is a uh a ticket uh a configuration in connect device? Uh, short answer, it doesn't, because that data isn't recorded unless one of you happens to know, uh, lovely individuals happen to know where that may be stored. I personally couldn't find it, so I had to resort to doing another API call looking for a specific data set. So, we're going to... That's wrong. Let's So, um, uh, 
just to make sure you guys understand, um, when I'm taking these variables like company ID, I'm transferring them into uh, strings. So instead of having one, two, three, four, five, six as an integer, uh, because you can do math on integers, um, you need to differentiate those between integers and strings. And I'm just saying, hey, this is not an integer, this is a string. Understand that it's a string. This way I can easily pass this data to in between other strings um, without having to worry about uh, it breaking um, and erroring out. So if you uh, look at the ConnectWise uh, data set for configurations, um, you're gonna have to uh, look around to see what it would signify as a, uh, a computer inside that tech. So every single machine that I have found um, has lab tech colon open question mark computer ID equals computer ID. Um, and that's how it signifies, hey, open this machine inside lab tech. So I look specifically for that data set inside of the REST API. I say, hey, API, can you see if you can find this information for me? It's basically like doing a SQL query uh, and saying, hey, do you have this column with this data inside of it? Um, it's the, uh, the only way I have found to determine if a computer is in fact in ConnectWise with its LabTech computer ID in LabTech. So now that we have that, our URL, we need to actually process it. So config data equals request.get, URL equals get config, headers equal hidden stuff dot, oh, oh, static fares, if I can type, dot header off. And then we want to convert this back to JSON so that we have the proper format. If I can type, which I don't seem to be able to. So if we found something, we should be able to set this. So now if we didn't, uh, we're going to try to set a variable. So basically, we're going to try to set the config data variable uh, at indice zero, which it should be zero. We want the first record that is available. We don't want to loop through. There should not be 10 different machines with all the same computer ID and lab tech. If there is, there's a major problem and you need to fix it. Um, but this will allow us to set the config ID variable with that ID. So we can add that configuration with some code that we're going to write in a second. Uh, and if it did not be able to set that, if it error, if Python erred out trying to process that, we're going to just set it to X. So we can process this that if we didn't actually uh, find a configuration, we can say, hey, if you didn't find one, put in something else instead of the configuration. We want to update the ticket with something else. So, so since we're going to add this data, um, this is the first adding that we have done to tickets, um, and it's 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 slightly different. We're gonna so we're gonna basically send ConnectWise information and say, "Hey, I need you to do this for me." And there's and, and the REST API, there's several methods to do this. There is patch, put, um, and there's one more um, post. Uh, and those all do different things. Um, it when you uh, a post is adding new data, patch is uh, updating. Or repl replacing or removing data, um, and I haven't found an accurate method to update yet uh, inside ConnectWise. At least um, I haven't really needed to. 
to really venture down that path anyway. So we're going to uh, build out how ConnectWise expects this information that it wants to add via post. And then we're going to send it that data so it adds it. So let's let's begin um, add config data equals. We're going to do a dictionary, and we're going to say your dictionary key of ID is your config ID. And then we're going to write this out in JSON. We're going to dump it, oops, dump s, our variable, which basically just formats it in a 100% proper way that ConnectWise is going to specialize it or expect it in. But if you're good enough, you're like, well, hey, what if the config ID is x? It's going to just error out, and then your application is going to crash, and you're going to hate yourself. Yes, you're right. That's when we can do this. If config ID equals X, print missing configuration information. Otherwise, let's begin to write this data. So we're going to make the URL config URL is going to be our base URL plus service tickets. We're going to add it to our ticket ID, um, which in this case, I'm going to hard code just because easiness. configurations and I'm going to actually push the data so we're going to do this via requests and we're going to do it instead of the get we're going to do a post call and the URL is going to be config URL the data is a new one is going to be add config data and our headers, just like always, are going to be static variables dot header off. So if we ran this now, it's going to not find anything um, because let's see if I made any errors. I did not make any errors. Woo me! Wait, that's that's actually the wrong. Uh, something's broken somewhere. Where are you broken at? Oop. I think that's it. No, nope, it's broken somewhere else. Where are you broken at? Here. Let's see. Um, I did not add the import JSON. That should fix that issue. Oh, uh, hold on a second. I've got to. It's not just going to magically connect to LabTech, is it? No, it's not. Because uh, I have a predefined function. Um, let's do hidden stuff. My SQL page on. And basically, uh, it establishes so basically that code looks like this. Ooh, 
just a rough day. Gotta answer Martin's question because he's always the important one. So, um, con equals PyMySQL dot connect, host equals host, user equals user, password equals password, database equals database. Uh, you want to mess if I use. Ooh, wow. You want to make sure you set the character set to UTF-8 just to make sure that we're passing along UTF-8. And then you want to specify the cursor class equals PyMySQL Come on, fingers. Cursors dot uh, dictionary cursor. And that basically is the entire function. Um, basically, I didn't want to type this out every single time I wanted to make a connection. So I wrote a function to do it. It's a simple function. Um, it basically says, connect here, run the SQL, and then give me back the data. So we established the connection. Um, uh, and then we say, uh, we set that connection as a cursor. And then we execute the SQL that were sent via the defined function. Which is that? Um, so we're sending, we're requiring you to send me SQL, and then we're fetching all that data and then sending all that data back to you. So if we run this, it shouldn't error out if I uh, happen uh, something else is broken. Uh, what else is broke? All right, and this is when you just say run and then tell me what's broken. Indention is broken. Where are you indented? Ooh. Indention is very important in Python. And by very important, I mean it is super important, otherwise it errors out. Uh, indention is how it determines what blocks go where. So obviously I didn't do enough to uh, uh, I have an error in my SQL syntax. So what did I error out on? And this is where uh, Troubleshooting 101 comes in. Just give me what I'm sending you. Echo it out to me. Tell me what I'm typing. What am I typing? Uh, um, interesting. So, I don't have my closing bracket. See? Look how useful that is. Now, now I didn't find anything, obviously. Um, So while building an application, it's important to know what's happening where. So if you want to know information, just echo it out before uh, it either errors out. So if it errors out on line 62, go before it and print out whatever variable is erroring out. Um, so in this case, oops, can you stop? Um, I'm not even getting to here, as you can see, because my SQL didn't return any data. So let's let's get rid of that and let's rename the variable. Uh, let me let me find a legit because
lab tech slow launching. All right. So, well, no, hold up. Key error ID. Do, do, do. Thank you. I made it myself. I got to update it because we changed our logo. I'm super excited about that, as you can tell. Live programming at its best. Hmm. Let's just see if this works. Oh, that's not going to work there. Wow. See? Never drink in program, kids. Never drink in program. Oh, missing configuration information. So I didn't find a config. Let's see if that's true or not. Let's see if we can't find us a configuration. So I'm pull up the company it's under. Go to the configurations tab. Look for the name. And look for management link. Hmm. Works. All right. And now I'll show you Postman because Postman is amazing.
or we can just do this. Let's do this. Um, company configurations conditions equals um, ID. No, I don't have ID. Let's see if I can just run this. Since that decided to do it, let's see if I can't find that. Hmm, it exists. So if we look at the actual code that it returned, that's what it returned. Since we're working, let's, let's, let's output what this is actually telling us or sending over so we can see what debug a little bit more. Mm. Oh. Let's see. You can look at my pretty desktop for a second while I see if I can't figure this out real quick like. not actually outputting the computer ID, which is odd. Oh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, in looking at everything and verifying everything, um, I'm obviously not going to find this configuration because I'm looking at the test company I have this ticket under and I'm, uh, trying to look there for this computer ID, which doesn't exist there because it doesn't exist there. So... Yeah. Uh, I'm a horrible individual. So this works. This adds the configuration to the machine. Um, if I were to move uh, my lab tech server over, it would in fact actually process and add this configuration. Um, so we can actually specify this. Let's I have the config ID eighteen.
and I will open this ticket and see if this is on there now. It did not add it. So, another point, uh, important feature of uh, Python and the request library is that you can uh, see the information inside of it. So you can echo out, were you denied? Why were you denied? You cannot convert string to integer. That's important. Um, Uh. Hmm. Not convert string to integer. Oh. Configuration object is invalid. Let's see if it likes the string better. Just for the record to everyone watching, this is programming in a nutshell. Um, you keep poking at it till you fix it. Ticket config company mismatch. So I can't manually add it to the configuration, which is horrible. So uh, this, this is the working code. Um, this will output what you want to output. Um, auto add the configurations to your tickets. How amazing is that? Does anyone have any questions who is currently present in the chat? So, uh, Mark West, um, here is uh, where I looked up the sequel. So, right here uh, is the sequel I'm looking at. Now, um, I called it automate sequels because I'm looking at uh, basically just doing a query inside the, the lab tech database. Um, here is the full code right here. Um, that looks up based on the variables we have already set, like the ticket company ID and the client name. The problem was uh, I didn't have a, a ticket associated with this um, specific uh, computer. I know there's no ticket name with Chase Smith, so I uh, associated with this company at least. So I just manually hard coded um, the 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 get SQL. So this processes the SQL and here's the function for the SQL processing. This is on a separate page uh, on my hidden in my hidden stuff file. Um, this is just everything with my personal data stripped out. And then it uh, processes that data will output the jQuery uh, or the string data that it, it, it develops it and then for then I do another for loop and then look for every computer in that and then I add that to the configuration every time. So you say you want to loop this. I was looking for the SQL courier looked up the config ID based on the username company. Oh you're welcome. Um, yeah that's 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 this one right here. Um, this uh, I whited it out or I commented it out so that I could uh, process uh, continue further writing the actual application um, so we want 
to loop this. And there's a couple of ways you can do this to loop, um, but do you want it to constantly be looping? Uh, I can tell you that's a bad idea because your ConnectWise will reject you eventually after so many uh, X number of uh, API hits. Uh, I don't know exact number um, uh, per day or hour or however it's set. So you want it to to sleep, right? So let's just sleep. 60 seconds. Um, and I'm pretty sure I don't have the library installed that allows me to sleep. Let me see what that is. Time. Yeah. Time. And I want to time.sleep. Sixty seconds. So once a minute, uh, this will just sleep for sixty seconds, and then it'll end. So to continue the process, you do a while loop. While everything is true, check new tickets. Uh, a while loop is similar to a for, except uh, a while loop will allow you to um, set a condition, kind of like an if statement. Um, in this case, we're setting it to true. So while it's true, which will be always because it's a, we've manually set it to true, uh, check new tickets. You run that function, check new tickets. And then it'll check new tickets and then sleep for 60 seconds, check new tickets, sleep for 60 seconds, check new tickets, sleep for 60 seconds until either you kill the application or it airs out for some reason or another. As you can see, we've written a lot of code here. Um, probably about a 150, 175 lines, according to everything. So now we come to the spot where I talk about cleanliness and code understanding. When you're writing code, you want to be able to understand what's happening, and you want to be able to do that in a sense that uh not only you can understand it but someone who acts who looks at the code that comes after you can understand it um so i have mine built out to modules as i call them so basically i have my main file and that that imports uh the module that i have so in this case it's new tickets Technically, I call them uh, CW process tickets. And then I've got a main loop, which is while true. CW process tickets dot check for new tickets. Night Gav. Um, Thank you. Let me know if you uh, need anything. I'll upload the video hopefully tonight. It'll probably be up tomorrow. Um, and then I'll throw a, a post up um, so you can catch anything you missed. Um, so uh, check your tickets. And then that constantly checks tickets. Now I actually put my sleep here for 20 seconds. So basically it's going to process this function and then sleep. Processes function and sleep. Processes function sleep. Um, and it it basically is this function, this process boards, which has uh, a different configuration URL, which puts in a board ID. Um, and it's a uh, condition search. This way I can limit it to board. Like I want to process my uh, alpha board and then my Bravo board, and then my Charlie board. And then once that's done, I can sleep. Um, so I have one function locally that processes everything, but I have other functions that this calls. What I wrote here is the main function. 
This is my main function. This entire uh, 13 through 71 line is my main function. And then I have sub functions that do specific things like uh, I have the MySQL function, um, which I pointed out a, sec uh, a little bit earlier that will just fetch all rows. Um, I could write one that just fetches the top row or fetches a specific row number or uh, anything that, it, you know, uh, is allowed uh, in Pi MySQL. Um, it'll separating specific things that get tedious into specific functions makes it a little easier, because all you have to do is call that function and process your SQL. It also makes it easier for others to understand what that does, because having a hundred lines of random information and text and indention becomes a little clustered to read. If you showed this to just some random person on the internet, they'd be like, what is this and why am I looking at it? Um, but if this was structured in a way that you comment your code well, like uh, before your functions, you can put in what it does. This checks for new tickets. And then adds a LT config based on the primary contact. Now people understand what this function does and its purpose. But you can also put comments in here like uh, bug returns false randomly. Find and fix. Kind of like what I put up here. You know, this is an issue. The above is broken. It works, but it converts incorrectly. I need to uh, I need to fix it for other uses. But again, this is all static data that I wrote once and copy and paste. Setting uh, default data such as your website.com and at to dos. Not that I'm aware of. Um, I haven't explored that much of PyCharm. Um, at may be a function definition with Python. Yeah, it's a function definition. Maybe a class signifier. There may be a uh, another way to, to add in a to-do function uh, set like IntelliJ. Um, it, it may even incorporate with IntelliJ. But this, the basics that I've covered um, scratches the surface for what the API is capable of. Good evening, Martin. How are you doing? Um, that's cool. Um, I didn't know that, uh, I'll have to look at IntelliJ and see if it, uh, it, because an at to do will list, uh, in a separate window, any comments. It's basically like a bug tracker for bugs you know about. So, uh, commenting your code is important. Defining stuff that you type constantly is important. Um, like you can even define your URLs. Um, oops. Oh, yeah, right there, to do. Sweet, interesting. That's actually pretty cool, I have to remember that. Um, but commenting your code, taking static, like uh, this conditions tab, you can even static out the, the ticket URL to be base URL plus this. And then you only have to call your conditions plus your ticket URL. Um, and troubleshooting, uh, good things to troubleshoot for getting data back. Um, Postman is an amazing tool set. Um, 
but you can do like for instance I'm ticket data I'm setting that variable it'll be ticket data dot oops dot uh, response let me just put it ahead so you can see ticket data dot response oh. Yeah, there we go. Content. Duh. This is just not going well. Um, you can pull out the specific response. So if you get a 400 error or a 404, uh, you know you're typing in the error wrong. If you're getting a 400 error, you know you got a uh, access denied. If you get a 200 response, you get a uh, uh, that means your code completed successfully. Um, the content will output what ConnectWise says, um, what they return to you. Uh, you can look up the specific requests uh, function library. Um, it's a, um, a quick Google search. Will Square you right up. Um, is there any questions so far of this uh, setup? I'm waiting patiently until the uh, stream catches up to to my words. Uh, just for the record, Darren and uh, Wesley and Z, that um, uh, I'm aware of that variable name. It doesn't exist, so it error out anyway. So I can name it whatever I wanted to name it. And Darren, you should register on Twitch just so you have access to this awesome platform because it's amazing. And maybe I can convince you to do a stream uh, involving, I don't know, whatever you consider yourself a professional in, uh, or a, an expert in, excuse me. Uh, Martin is going to volunteer to do one on Citrix. So that'll be like a one view stream. Um, uh, we don't worry about uploading that one to YouTube because no one cares about Citrix. <laughs> Um, I'm waiting for the notifications to pop up saying, oh my God, how dare you? Uh, but that's all for me that I have tonight. Um, unless someone else has any questions. Uh, yes, definitely, Darren, you should... Uh, you, you, you should do a, a complete live stream specifically making fun of Mindy. He's not here to defend himself right now. I'm not doing this in JavaScript because it can be done. Uh, I guess I'll wrap it up here. Um, end of the stream. And uh, don't forget, we want feedback on how this went. Uh, we'd like your opinions on how to make it better. Uh, what more information to cover. If there's any more in depth you want to go to. Anything else like that. So, uh I appreciate you guys tuning in um, to those of you who are watching now who watch the stream and who are going to watch the video. Thank you very much and have a amazing evening. <laughs>